Good morning. Welcome back. Thank you for coming. As you can see from the screen, I added a series of small PDFs with frames taken at two seconds intervals from the film Detour. There are six of these files that I've already loaded on my browser, and I will use them to illustrate the visual style of the film, which is more prominent, more readable, more conspicuous for a film such as Detour. And of course, it matches the themes, the vibe, the story in the film. Feel free to look at those when you're working on your viewing notes. The viewing notes for this film are due on Friday this week by the end of the day. And as usual, they reside on my Stony Brook Google Drive account. So you need to lo be logged in. Even if you are logged in into your Stony Brook email, you'll immediately have access to those files. If there are any issues with the download, if the sharing privileges were not set up correctly, just let me know. And of course, up here, you find the whole film and the entire series of frames from it. We start from the beginning. This is the black frame right after the credits and before the beginning of the story. Let me summarize the story in case you haven't seen the film yet or you haven't seen all of it. The whole story is being told by the character of Al, whom we find at the beginning of the movie inside a diner in Nevada. And what he tells us, so it's his version of the story, that's very important, is that Al was working in a nightclub in New York, he was in love, and he was in some kind of relationship, certainly not a strong relationship, with the blonde singer Sue, the star of the nightclub. One night, they leave the nightclub, at 4 a.m., and she tells him that she's leaving New York. She's going to L.A. to pursue a career as an actress. And in fact, in the novel, by the end of the novel, when things have gone horribly wrong for Al, she uh, uh, communicates to a friend, and therefore to the readers, that she's gotten an audition. And we know that she'll have the career that she was looking for without him. She says, I'm going to LA and we'll defer whatever plans we have for our long-term relationship to the moment, to the time when I will be successful or both of us will be successful. Al is very passive, doesn't say, don't go or I'll come with you. No, let her go. A few days later, he's very sad, dejected, calls her, learns that she's just working in a diner as a hash slinger. So, working as a sous chef in a diner, in a small diner in LA. And he has this illumination, oh, I'll come, with, I'll come to you, I'll uh, marry you. And being the kind of guy that we've already seen, kind of passive, not very proactive, not a good planner, not taking full responsibilities for his decisions, he doesn't say, I'll be there by this day. He says... I don't know how I'll come there because he doesn't have the money to take the train. And he says, just expect to me. So one day, it's, it's like luck or chance. And he starts hitchhiking from New York to LA. Things do not go very well. The, he's traveling very slowly. He's running out of money. Eventually, he's picked up when he is in Nevada. He's picked up by this rich guy, kind of cocky, full of himself, who goes by the name of Haskell. 
He's driving a very fancy car, a 1941 Lincoln with a big V12 engine, which in fact, we know how cheap the production of the movie is. That car was the director's car, who used it because they couldn't pay a rental and rent a car uh, for, for the production. So they're driving, and Haskell tells Al his story. First, he tells him how, explains the scars on his hand, his right hand, I believe, which were caused by a woman. So he had this encounter and fight with a woman. Then he tells him his life story, how as a teenager, he played a game with swords and seriously wounded a friend and then ran away from home to avoid the consequences. And this, of course, is kind of predictive of what will come to Al, isn't it? It's part of the vibe. Haskell using, is using Al so that they can drive longer hours. So Al takes the wheel, Haskell is asleep before this happens. We've seen Haskell taking pills, and we don't know what those pills are. Al, of course, doesn't ask what they are. And at some point, it's raining. The car is an open-top car, and Al stops in the middle of this pouring rain to put on the roof of the car. Haskell is not waking up. And when Al eventually opens the door uh, on Haskell's side to see what is going on with him, Haskell just falls down off of the car, hits a rock with his head, and is dead. Keep in mind the pills, because you have to put it in a social and historic context. During the war, the movie was produced at the end of 1945, right? During the war, both sides, the Germans and the Americans, were using a lot of amphetamines. The Germans were using this pill called Pervitin. The Americans were often using Benzedrin. So by the end of the war, there were large quantities of these pills that enter circulation, or people who kept using those pills, especially to fight fatigue, right? Which was the purpose of distributing it to the soldiers. You are uh, part of the Battle of the Bulge. You have to stay awake for 36 hours because the enemy is attacking. Take a pill, right? Take 10 pills if it needed. It doesn't really work, right? It makes you fuzzy eventually. Anyway, it can cause heart failure. So we don't know really if Haskell already had a heart attack or he died as a consequence of Al awkwardly, goofily opening the door. So Al just drags the body into a ravine, takes the car, and continues on his journey. Stops at a road motel and impersonates Haskell, right? The matrix that we talked about is very clear, very easy to decode for this film. He puts on the elegant, they're both same uh, height, allegedly same age. Haskell looks very old, but in the movie he says, I'm 31. Whoa, heart 31. Um, and so he pretends to be Haskell, continues on this journey to California, stops to get water for his car. All cars had cooling system, but they over overheated easily, especially in hot temperatures. At the gas station, he picks up a woman who's hitchhiking herself. The woman gets on the car, and they continue traveling. At some point, the woman turns to him suddenly and tells him, you're not Haskell. I know Haskell, I know this car. She's, in fact, the woman who scarred, who made the, the scars on the hand of Haskell. And so at that point, 
he doesn't have a good story. She knows that something happened to Haskell because otherwise he wouldn't have his car. And she's blackmailing Al. She wants all the money that Haskell, the cash that Haskell was carrying with him. Haskell is a gambler, so he had almost a thousand dollars, eight hundred dollars cash. He was going back to California. He said, because a road trip is the place for storytelling that is also partly fictional in a road movie. So the story Haskell tells Al is that he's going to California to bet on a horse. And that is true, but to a point. By the end of the movie, we'll know that the bet would have paid in a big way because one of Sue's friends who works in the diner will win $57 by betting on that horse. However, the real purpose of the trip made by Haskell to California is that he wants to get money out of his father, if indeed he is Haskell. Because we know later on that Haskell's father is dying, and that they're looking for his son who would inherit a fortune worth many millions of dollars. So Haskell is probably going there either to reveal that he's the son or to exchange uh, alleged information about the whereabouts of the son for money. We don't know really. When Sue learns that Haskell was the son of this uh, dying millionaire, she says, no, I don't want the money. Let's not sell the car because I want you, Al, to pretend that you're Haskell's son and then we will split the money 50-50. Things don't go well. Al refuses to play the card, also rejects all the advances, all the advances by the, the flirtatious moves, uh, gestures, by, uh, by Vera, and it's kind of telling that Sue, his official relationship partner, is never very intimate with him, shows no gestures of affection, whereas Sue is pursuing Al quite strongly and seems almost to be sincere because she's desperate. She's also dying, apparently. There is a final fight because Al is refusing to uh, play his part in this scam. So uh, Vera, Vera is saying, I'll call the police. She takes the phone, which has a very long cord, which happened a lot in American movies in the 1940s and 50s, these very long cords, because people wanted to, they had one phone, but they wanted to be able to carry it around to different rooms. So she takes the phone to her bedroom in this apartment in a hotel in LA. He's on the other side of the door. She's calling the police. So he has this cord in front of him, grabs the cord and pulls and pulls and pulls. He doesn't know that when she entered the bedroom running and drunk, she wrapped the cord around her neck, which is significant as a uh, uh, difference with the novel. In the novel, they have a fight and he grabs her neck, applies too much force, ends up strangling her unintentionally. The same way that Tom Neal unintentionally killed his wife in 1965. But instead, in the film, it is kind of unintentional. It is more unintentional, right? He pulls until she's strangled, he enters the room, she's dead, and we go back to the beginning, to the flashback, to the place where the flashback began when the story was being told. He's in this diner, leaves the diner, and he tells us that at this point he is condemned to live on the road and always afraid that uh, the police will pick him up one day and he has no story. And we do see the, a police car driving by him, stopping, taking him into the car. However, we don't know whether this is the scenario that he has in his mind as a nightmare, or whether it is in fact the actual end of his story. Now, let's look at 
the frames, the angles in the first scene. One more general introduction to the style. So, as a film noir, the film itself is based on a very flimsy story, but also on strongly based on a theme or a vibe, which is dark. And in order to express that, it borrows techniques of filming and camera angles and editing from the German Expressionist cinema. I mentioned how uh, Ulmer, the director in the 1920s, was working as an assistant director with European directors, in particular with Murnau, a German director who was a strong representative of the German Expressionism. German Expressionism is based on the idea that the inner world of every individual is in turmoil, is chaotic, and that as, as modern individuals in the modern times, since we don't have religion or other systems of value to keep us sane, to keep, it, uh, keep our lives in an organized, orderly uh, structure set up, this chaos cannot come to an end, and this chaotic world will come out one way or the other. How does it come out? It come out in form, in, in the form visually, in the form of dissonance. So there is always something off, which is very evident, for example, in the representation and the use of the face of Tom Neal, the actor who plays Al, right? Not only because you have these close-ups of the face with darkness and light strongly contrasted on the face, but also because the expression itself is more than sadness, is more than nostalgia. It's a very complicated expression that is not immediately readable and cannot be explained easily with just one adjective. It's just the, uh, uh, the, the, the outer expression of this chaos, which is human life, the lack of meaning, the lack of sense that uh, modern culture, 20th century culture, especially during the first part of the 20th century, emphasizes. Other ways this is accomplished, the dark vibe of the film, is by showing very, very few wide shots. You never see Al in the world. His world is always limited. And of course, this is easier to accomplish with the 4x3 format, which is typical of films such as It Happened One Night, but also this one, D2. Okay, it's not the 16x9 we used to, and, and that was introduced and became popular by the 1960s. Very few open shots, and whenever you have a closer shot, shot, you always see Al on one side cornered or close to someone in a position of fight. So there is this sense of oppression. He's always inside, inside the vehicle, inside small room, inside an apartment, or inside his head when you have the extremely close shots. When he's with Vera, they're either distant, because the relationship is confrontational, or they're close, but they're fighting. And sometimes she gets close to him, touches him, tries to flirt with him, but he rejects her every time. Okay? So let's look at this. From the dark frame, uh, can we also lower the shades in the back so we'll be able to catch a few more details. Thank you. From the dark frame, you get to the main character on the road. 
And the only thing you know about him comes out of his face and demeanor. The, the tie is loose, uh, the shirt is open, so even though he's wearing a fancy dress, we know that he's coming from a position of wealth or happiness into a position uh, that is not so pleasant. And you know that there is some kind of tragedy, some kind of negative situation. But keep in mind, in this kind of film, you don't have a background story right away. It's essentialist. Essentialism is one of the qualities of a film noir. The character, even when we know about his past, we don't know much. The character is supposed to be anyone. Anyone of us could be him. He's on the road in darkness, and notice that he's not even on the side of the road. It's kind of in the middle of the road, and cars are passing by, but he's not re even reacting. He's not trying to hit child. Okay, and then you see more and more of him. Now notice when the first car, and keep in mind every frame, every page on this PDF is two seconds later. Notice how dissonance is expressed in this case. He's hitchhiked, and you notice there is a transition, right? One of the dissolved transition where you have a frame from the previous scene overlapping a frame of the new scene, right? So you see, you see, the shoulder and the side of Al's body. So you know that the next is the very first frame. Notice that the car is not placed symmetrically within the shot. The car is not centered. And this kind of asymmetry is one of the tricks of um, the, the expressionism in cinema. Kind of weird symmetries or angles. And the asymmetry will be emphasized even more by the next shot. Because you, you see this, and little by little, it's out that becomes almost central to the frame, right? Not both drivers. And you know that there is a tragic situation right from Al's face. But you can't really decipher Al's face. He played the part well. He probably followed closely the directions of the directors. And now you see a little bit more. And this is one of the few shots where you see, you perceive something around it. Of course, it's all fake. But you see that there are cars, then you will see lights indicating that this is Reno, Nevada. And Reno, Nevada, in the 1920s and 30s, was famous for a sign that says, the, littlest big, the biggest little city in the world. And it was a place like Las Vegas for fun and happiness, right? And this contrast with uh, him. See, the biggest little city, and W-O, and Reno above, and again, is more and more central to the shot with this asymmetry that gives you a sense of dissonance or chaos. And now you see Reno. Of course, again, they didn't go to Reno to shoot this. They just put the signs and made it dark. Now we are in the diner. And where will you find the protagonist out? You will find him in this corner when he will appear. And there will be only two positions uh, in the corner, so separate from others, or cornered, maintaining his position. The body is stiffly maintained, and his placement, he helps the actor, holds his place in this corner. This will be one position, and you see frame after frame that he stays there. Or he will be trapped in between two characters, where you see Someone in the foreground, someone in the background, and out in the middle. With the walls of this diner, of course, very close, to give this sense of oppression, but also the sense of entrapment for Al. And here is Al in his corner. Of course, the shot, as you expect from any good director that do it even now, is arranged structurally. See how 
the edge of the desk of the diner goes straight into the corner, right? The camera has been precisely placed there. And the light defines the upper limit, right? And then you have this horizontal, vertically almost centered line of the diner. So follow him frame from frame. I'll advance them um, quickly. And notice as an element of disturbance, the menus. Modern directors would not have placed this here because it occupies too much space and distracts the viewer. But Ulmer does that. For example, towards the end, when uh, there are constant arguments between Al and Vera, you will see a lamp with a shade right in the middle. And it's almost covering Al. And it's staying, it's staying in the middle between Al and Vera. And you say, why? Why have that? That, that's not a clever move, but it is instead. It is part of the process of unsettling, right? Meaning you don't want a set that is too clean if you want to express darkness, entropy, chaos. Whereas if you look, if you watch Drive My Car, which is the last film at the end of the class 2022, everything there is perfectly clean for a reason. Perfectly organized. Okay, and you see again that Al remains in that corner of the frame even when the camera zooms in. But notice again that even if they zoomed in, the desk is still ending up right in this corner. But he remains there, and they're just playing with focus. He's out of focus, the other who's talking is on focus, and alternates, right? Who's in focus. Traditional way to handle two characters. But he stays on that side, right? And it is the other character who's moving around, because the other character is lively. The other character has plans wants to go north and take him with him to, to talk, etc. Al remains contained, closed. His, he has a secret to hide. And the other character is expressive through his face. Our face remains just enigmatic, right? And again, it's hard to put an adjective to the face itself. And continues to stay there, right? He's only moving his face and sometimes just slightly his shoulder. Again, he remains there. Every time I change the frame is another two seconds. He turns, but he's still holding position now. He sits up a little bit, but still holding the same position, right? And shot after shot, frame after frame, that's where Al is, until you have this new setup, which communicates the same sense, that is to say, entrapment, where you have, you can draw a diagonal line from the woman in the diner, Al, and the jukebox, with the customer who's playing the song that will irritate so much Al. So Al is trapped within this place, right? The walls seem to be even closer than they are uh, because of the lens. And he's just there between them. And notice how they use the structural element of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the bar, right? Uh, because that is part of the idea of entrapment. So even when she will leave and no one is here, you still have this, which is almost a wall, producing this effect of trapping. Oh. Look, you see, now the woman is not there, but the first element is producing this effect that Al is being trapped in between the desk, the jukebox, the wall of the diner, the other character. And, of course, as usual, he holds his position, and then we have, we zoom in into his face, and again, it's sad, but there is more to it, and already you see the light, 
the, light, the reflection of the lights exaggerating the facial expression, right? Because Al is getting into his past. And all of a sudden, he has this realization that the song is the same song they used to play when he was in love with Sue and life still was hopeful for him. And again, we go back to the same kind of shot before, the diagonal line and the structural elements. And again, you see three characters in diagonal line and out, right trapped, right in the middle, still very much holding his position. <coughs> Excuse me. see Al in the middle, still holding his place, and then, as it will happen later on with an ashtray, they use the coffee mug to transition from Al to his flashback to bring, to carry the story ahead. Again, strong contrast, this time an exaggerated use of shadows, right, on his face, because we're moving into darker memories. And the overall environment, the diner itself gets darker, right? You see here. Now just the eyes, because of course the eyes are the gates to the soul, and therefore he's going into his memory to talk about his past. And notice how he's just moving his eyes, moving his face slightly, but the shoulder remains there, right? Fixed so that you maintain your concentration on his face. And there are two objects that will carry on the story from here to the flashback. One is the coffee mug, right? The reality of his instant, of this instant, is they are drinking coffee. Notice that they haven't chosen any coffee mug. Notice the texture, right? The, the, the object has to be able to carry the shot. So. Even if you have a cheap movie, you choose your props properly, right? You cannot have just a whitish coffee mug, neutral, right? This is something else. And the handle of the coffee mug, then the jukebox, because it is the music that is carrying us and out into its past. And from there, we'll go to the drums and we'll find ourselves in the nightclub in New York, and we find again Al, and Sue comes here, and I've explained before that this is indicative of the kind of pseudo relationship really Sue the singer has with Al, because she's singing a love song, sometimes looking at him, but they're not connected, they're not facing each other, right? And it's from the point of view of a symbolic reading of this shot, it's like she is in his head. This love is in his head. You can hear her, but she's not a presence. And this will be true for the rest of his life. She, he'll be continuing to think about her. Okay? And, and this is almost the end of what I wanted to show. Again, he keeps his position, never looks up at her. And let me introduce the second one. Now this is when he, she's already in Los Angeles, he calls her, uh, so sad he wants to reunite with her, and notice that this time everything is clear, and there are very, very few clear shots where there is a lot of light, and they're all intentional, right? So light Plenty of light because this is happiness. This is the kind of paradise that he, that he wants to, to have, his life with, uh, with Sue. Notice, though, that there is a stark contrast between the body posture and the frame of Sue, right? She's not moved by this phone call. She's sitting very calmly, holding the phone, and contrast this position, which doesn't betray a lot of passion, a lot of desire, with Al's frame, 
He's into the phone, right? He's like there. I, I want to be with you. I want to kiss you, right? And she's distant already. Again, we know it's not a strong relationship. It is in his mind. And he says something silly, such as, I was a healthy boy, she was a healthy girl, and so it was natural that we would have a relationship, right? Which, which is a bogus basis for a relationship. Meaning, it's natural that we should fall in love, but it's not so natural. Okay. Again, he keeps his position there and does all the talking. At some point, we don't even hear Sue anymore. And he leaves to go. And, and like many other films during this period, you have heavy reliance on maps to show travel, right? The star is New York, even though it's not Manhattan. They placed it above Manhattan to show so that they wouldn't obscure the writing of New York. And it's going, not, not the in a straight line, right? Uh, it's going around a lot. And notice that even though it's outside, you don't really see a lot of landscape. With this shot from below, which is an awkward angle, but again, reminiscent of German expressionism, you, because of this angle, you see the branches, you see the sky, but it gives this sense of solitude, not this sense of placement in a world. And here you see more. You see the track, you see the road, but this is one of just a few shots. Mostly it's his face or his torso with the sky, right? And he goes from place to place. Already in here, you don't see much landscape and in the, for, for the next two cars, you see just the driver and Al, right? Which again gives the sense of oppression. The, the frame is crowded, right? There is no landscape. Landscape horizon would be freedom, would be hope, would be his destination. And instead, it's this situation that is trapping him. He's on the road, but with no control. And again, here, just the car, no landscape. More map. And finally, more landscape, but simply because the landscape is not reassuring. It's in itself threatening because it's in the desert of Arizona. Although, don't believe for a minute they went to Arizona. It was all shot in California. So it's a desert somewhere in California. And look at these um, poles for electricity. Probably they're the same poles we're seeing in other scenes. Of course, they were everywhere in California, but most probably they went to a place and shot three or four scenes. And again, from the landscape, the shot from down below showing the sky and Al, right? This sense of being lost. Or his face occupying most of the screen. And the cars are going by, nothing is happening, cannot reach his goal, and he continues to wander in this desert. At this point, we know that He's suffering physically as well. Car after car, they ignore him. And then, for the first time, you see a wider shot of the car because they need to show that this is a fancy car, a rich man's car, and this is Haskell that is picking him up. Once again, though, you have a close-up. You have a road. This is the same stretch of road that will be used later on for the border when he crosses the border into California, so they went to this place and shot two different scenes. Okay. And see the, the poles that you have in a variety of scenes. And notice the asymmetry again, play, playing out here, right? So that the top of the trunk of, of the engine lid is not perfectly centered, that the shot is centering out, and more and more he will become the center of, this, of the frame, right? Because even though he has been picked up, he's still lost in daydreaming, and not very happy either, right? Even though Asuka will tell him that they're going all the way to Los Angeles. Again, the attention is all on Al.
and you can already see the scars on Askel's hand. And this is when Askel takes the first pill. It's in between these two second intervals without Al asking anything. And Askel is telling his story, which could be pretend, right? Could be part fiction, storytelling. And now just a frontal shot, more symmetrical because they're exchanging chatter and then Haskell will tell his story. Okay, so for a moment he's smiling, but the moment he smiles, we go to darkness again. And it is during the night, fittingly, that he will finally notice the scars and will have to hear the story of how the scars were produced. Of course, notice how the eyes are picked up by the rear view mirror in here. And again, the asymmetry with Al closer to the center of the scene. And this is enough for this particular sequence. And we move on to another interesting sequence. So Haskell is dead. Al is continuing the journey, pretending to be Haskell, putting on the clean clothes and the elegant clothes that Haskell had in his suitcase. He is in a road motel. We don't see the road motel outside. We just go straight into the room and notice how sparsely furnished the room is and notice the reflections, right? What is it reminiscent of? What is it, what is it suggestive of? What other kind of place would have grids similar to those? Like a prison? Like a jail cell, exactly, right? And a jail cell would also be sparsely furnished, right? So he's there, but his face is still perplexed, right? He's not very confident, just a little bit. And you just see the inside, right? You see one hanger, perfect use of props, because even if you have a low budget, you can still be uh, creative one hanger in the corner, right? This is a simple road motel, no luxury. And finally, he's out. And the moment he's out, this is two seconds later, he's about to stop at a gas station. No landscape, no freedom and speed on the road. I'm so happy, I'm driving this fancy car and, and I have money in my pockets. I'll be with Sue in, in three or four hours. No, nothing. Just him in stopping the gas station, but what is the one element you're supposed to notice in this shot? Where is Vera? Right there, Sandra. Right? Right there at the, at the center. At least it's not perfectly centered, but if you look at this prominent central object, which is the rear view mirror, she's there, right? And it's the incongruous element. We don't know about her yet, but we cannot fail to notice and in fact, we see her again, and she's holding her position. Holding her position makes her more visible. He stops at this gas station. There is no one, right? Because his world is not a world of connectedness. He's separate. He's isolated. And he goes there. He needs to get water, as I said, for the car. Notice how, again, there is something in the middle. And again, you might ask, same as for the menu or same as for the lamp in the apartment at the end of the film. Why do I have these things in front of me that I, I cannot see the car, I cannot see Al? It is intentional. It is another way within a space that is largely empty to enclose the character because he, through this sequence, will remain closed in between the pumps and the, the gas pumps and the poles of the roof of the gas station. Okay, so follow this kind of trapping through the visual, right? You see him between pumps, you see him with more space, but again, there are one, two, three poles. So it's still kind of a closed in space. 
and the camera is holding the air, it's moving up, and then slowly we turn, right, and you see the same pole, so we're not too far from the place where they shot the other scenes. With Haskell, and finally, again, on a diagonal line, traced by the lid of the car to this point, we see her, and she's very prominent because of her posture. She's the opposite of Al. Al was desperate. <laughs> she's in control, right? There is no one there, no one to pick her up, but she's not afraid, right? So you see her, and again, you almost don't see him because even though it's an empty space, you have the pump, you have the pole, you have these objects crowding the frame and producing this, this effect, dissonant effect. The diagonal between the car and she is, and her is more evident and she will keep this position even though the camera will move and then eventually zoom on her, but she will keep this position if you compare her position to the pole, you see that she's standing there, right? Everything is deliberate, intentional. So she's not moving. He's asking her to come. She's not really moving. Okay, she's still there. She's not requesting a ride. Doing nothing, really. Not calling on his attention. And finally, he says, now, come on if you want a ride. But her reaction is not to move at all. I'll move when I want. You're not ordering me around. I don't need your ride. Right? That's the position. And she keeps this posture. Then she starts moving slowly. And even though the camera is moving a bit, we see her position relative to the poles that is the same position she's adjusting her dress right because of course her power is through her seduction right and in the in the book when he picks her up she's really in a pitiful condition her uh, her dress is torn it's like someone who has been sleeping on the road outside for days here she, she's slightly more elegant, more in control. Again, look at her position. Anne Savage was the queen of these B-movies, was very good at playing these characters, which were very sketchy, meaning they were not sketched, they were not scripted in, in complicated ways, right? Uh, but, but she was very good at this kind of thing and did a lot, at least 20 B-movies. Holding the position, right? Same positions, moving only slightly, very slowly moving, two seconds after each frame. So she's moving very slowly and still advancing along this imaginary diagonal line, coming towards him with this very intense face, right? She represents a character typical of films from this era and, and well into the 1970s, the femme fatale. And I provided a link if you want to read more about the femme fatale. It's like kind of a dangerous, poisonous kind of female, right? Meaning that if you enter in a relationship, you will <laughs> suffer. Like, that's the idea. And she's coming. Again, look at the pole in the back and you know that she's followed this diagonal towards the car. And she comes into the space where Al has remained trapped and gets into the car, but again, you see that the frame is crowded by these structural elements which express this lack of harmony, this, this kind of closeness and intensity, and gets into the car, and finally, they leave. Now the asymmetry is played on the side of Vera, right? His to the side, the car is not centered, and she's there, and of course she has this face, so you know that something is about to happen, that there is something wrong, but you don't know what. And this is part of the style of a film noir. Okay, and of course, they're in a studio, the images in the back are being projected, right? There is a screen in the background, they're projecting the, the landscape, and they're in the car. And again, she keeps her position in the frame, right? More central. And then you have this very intense profile. He's talking about his thoughts about her, and she keeps this intense stare because 
this is conducive to an element of dissonance which will be her turning to him. So kids, the profile, we see him, and notice that now, compared to the other shot, they look much closer, right? In the other shot, you see the car is big, so there, one is there, one is here. Now, from this shot, because of the lens, they seem very, very close inside the car, because that's the dynamic between them. Closeness and fight, distance and confrontation. And you alternate these positions from here to the end of the film. She keeps this face, cannot be read easily, and is growing worried. Look at the frowning on his forehead, right? Keeps her position, again, the profile. And now she turns. Because of the fact that the profile was kept steady for a lot of frames, for 20, 30 seconds, the turning becomes dramatic, right? Because she has to say something and, or, or she knows something because she hasn't said anything yet. She will say so later. Again, they're very close in here. And this time they may be actually driving in this, in this scene. Uh, okay. And she goes to sleep. Remember that this is the same kind of act performed by Haskell before he died. So there is something ominous about this. Because the last time he was driving and someone was asleep in the car, it didn't go well, it didn't end well. So you know that this is predictive, that the frame is predictive of something else. And notice that he seems to be in control, right? Arm out, and she seems to be innocent. But again, same kind of game that they played before with the profile. She keeps there pretending to be asleep, and for long enough, that when she wakes up and says, you're not Haskell. What happened to Haskell? What did you do to him? Why did you have, do you have your, this guy? This becomes dramatic because the same posture has been held for so long. And there it is, keeps same position, he's driving, he's moving more to emphasize her stillness, looking at her, checking on her, fantasizing about her, and then finally, takes quite a bit. Finally, there it is. Two seconds, she opened her eyes, it's like Frankenstein, right? Open his eyes, like the monsters in horror movies from this period. Uh, look, she's back from the dead. Uh, look at the amount of white in her eyes, right? And then, next frame, two seconds later, sitting up, facing him and accusing him of murder. You're a murderer, you're a criminal. I have it in my hand, I can control you. And the same way that Al never thought of telling Sue in the first scene after the nightclub night, I'll come with you. In here, Al never thinks of, I'll throw you out of the car or don't threaten me. I'm, I'm a strong, strongly built man. No, no. From this moment on, you see her head is even higher, even though she's in the back. She's towering over him. It's done. It's cooked. Right? His has become her puppet, right? And then they go to Los Angeles. She explains what will happen, how they, she will get the money, the, the car, uh, and we go back to him because him will have to blame fate and say, oh, why did I have to encounter her? He called on her. He fell into that trap. He was traveling on a stolen car, didn't have to pick up a strange woman. Okay, so he's denying his responsibility here and later on. I have to stop, unfortunately. Uh, I would have loved to continue with more sequences. Let me know if you need any help with this week's assignment, which is due Friday, or if you need an extension, ask politely before the deadline. Okay?